the meeting is now live. Good evening and welcome to the Greeley City Council work session this ninth day of April 2024. I'll call this meeting to order and ask that you stand if you're able to join us for the pledge. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Hi, Councilmember Levin. Present. Councilmember Levin. Present. Mayor Garcia-Paul. Present. Councilmember Levin. Present. Councilmember Olson. Present. Councilmember Johnson. Present. Mayor Hayes. Present. All seven members of City Council are present this evening. Item four is reports from Mayor and Council members. Any reports, colleagues? Councilmember Olson, please. So at the North Front Range meeting, we had a really good talk. I just want to give everybody a heads up. For, um, the U.S. 34 Coalition North Front Range have created a TMO, Transportation Management Organization, that's going to be along U.S. 34. So, And it's really us starting it. We have a company called Steer on Board to help us develop the strategies and the vision and the mission and everything. They're going to be reaching out. We're going to need to be funding some things, but a lot of it eventually will be private and it'll be nonprofit organization, C3, 501C3, is that right? Uh, so it'll be that, and there'll be. They've already started doing some engagement with our our folks and our, our public works department. But I think it's going to be pretty unique along the US 34 corridor between Kersey all the way to Loveland. Um, there's nine communities, but we'll probably have to start figuring out if we're going to how we're going to fund some of it in the beginning until we get enough business partners. They're going to be working with all the chambers. Um, and it's just finding ways to minimize commute, getting people in transit, getting people to walk by bus and commute and businesses to help support that with their organization. So it'll be a good thing. It's the first TMO in Northern Colorado. Uh, there's about 22, I think, 22 or 23 in the state. Um, and it's just a promotion of mobility choice and giving people options. So I think it's a good thing. I'll, when I get information on it, I'll send it out. We're just setting up the charter now and all the processes. So, but it'll be interesting. Um, we're going to play a big part. We have to find a representative for the steering committee. That's not me. Um, Will and I sort of had a little texting message a little bit, and either maybe from the uh, from our staff or anybody that like to. Um, but we're going to need to have a representative on the steering committee. And since I'm on the coalition, I think it'll be us initially, and then we'll have to split it out and find some other folks. They'll have business folks, representative from each uh, uh, city or county, four business folks in the DOT, and there'll be uh, DOT will be a non-voting member. But um, so it'll be a pretty unique board, and I'll keep working with Will and Paul to try to figure out: Do we want to? <laughs> transportation advisory group person to sit on it? Do we want the city staff person to sit on it? Just make sure we fit all the legal criteria of that. Thank you. Any additional reports? Councilor Butler, please. Um, this is actually an initiative, if that's okay, Mayor. Can we do an initiative when we don't, uh, not at a, when we're not at a business meeting? I don't know what happened on real protocol on that. I mean, is there anything legally that no, there's no legal prohibition. I think you, you can just indicate uh, that this relates to an initiative. And, and we do just seek um, uh, consensus. 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 So yeah. go ahead, Tom. Um, so um, as we've talked before um, about the sergeant's ballot initiative to help our police sergeants uh, join the police union, um, that um, uh, city staff has worked uh, diligently to get some language that has all the various parties with that um, in agreement. Um, and I would like to ask that to go to ordinance uh, at our next meeting. Consensus with regard to Councilor Butler's initiative. Okay. There is consensus. Thank you. Anything else? I would like to remind our council and our community of tomorrow evening's uh, virtual community meeting, April 10th, five o'clock regarding uh, the uh, police law enforcement services study that's been going on for quite some time. I'm guessing the link is on our webpage. Okay. Anything that I should add to that comment, Chief Turk? No, I was going to also throw one on there. Keep it my turn. Okay. 
We'll watch it. We'll wait and you can repeat yeah. what I just said, but better, okay? Yes. Yeah. Any additional comments, Council? Item five is Greeley Mobility Services update. Paul, I think uh, Anna Johnson, Michelle Johnson, Will Jones coming up. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for the rubber bus. <laughs> I doubt any of us will use this as stress relief. But it is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Don't you. challenge me. Yeah. <laughs> Part of the question. Thank you and good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Um, council members, thank you for your time tonight. I'm um, just going to kick us off. And this is the team to my right. Will Jones, uh, Hannah Johnson, Michelle Johnson. Hannah is our mobility coordinator. Michelle is our mobility manager. Go Will, well, um, they're going to do the presentation tonight. This is a follow up to Council Member uh, Butler's uh, initiative on sort of transit, sort of update. Part of that has to do with, I think you guys hear often, sort of maybe. Uh, comments and concerns about uh, at regular meetings uh, from members of the public. And so we're going to try to address a lot of those issues um, tonight right. so you get a better sense of that. And I think also, you know, in your packet that the presentation had a series of appendix pieces just with a little more data on some of the things that we're uh, going to present in fairly, fairly short time. We're very thorough. Thank you. Yep. And welcome back. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you again for your time tonight. Uh, tonight, we're going to provide a little insight, as Paul mentioned, not only the current state of mobility in Greeley, but more importantly, the direction for which staff is um, planning on going based off of your feedback, as well as the public. Um, next slide. Oops, sorry, I want to take you back, please. Don't mind. Thank you. Uh, during tonight's presentation, he'll receive an update on Greeley's first micro mobility pilot, gain insight into the mobility development plan which is really roadmap into the implementation of the mobility umbrella, including in the adopted real on the go transportation master plan. And lastly, a review of projects um, that we believe will come out of the mobility development plan um, for consideration as it relates to funding. Uh, with that said, I'll now hand it off to Hannah. She is our project manager for the micro mobility. Uh, good evening, Council. Um, so last fall, we all reviewed and passed a new shared micromobility business licensing ordinance that created the framework for um, kind of the regulatory framework for um, how a shared micromobility business could operate on our streets here in Greeley. Um, since then, our staff has researched the best industry practices for regulating shared micromobility further through that business licensing framework. Um, we sat down with peer communities such as um, Fort Collins, Grand Junction, uh, the city of Denver, um, who had shared micromobility on their streets for several years to take their lessons learned, try to avoid any of their um, missteps um, as we deploy maybe a pilot here in Greeley. Um, we've also sat down with key local stakeholders to understand really specific goals and concerns. Um, one of the key takeaways from other communities is that they recommended testing, um, you know, what we think is going to be the best fit for our community um, with an understanding that we would need a flexible piloting process and program. And then um, after we see how that first pilot goes, um, adjust the, the program from there. Um, so. Uh, based off of um, that research and outreach, we are proposing to do a one-year pilot starting this summer, um, running for one year to accomplish the goals outlined on the slides provided. Um, we really think that having a piloting period provides transparency to the businesses that would be investing in um, having their shared micromobility services here, um, and really being transparent to the city intends on potentially making some changes after that piloting period. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is the proposed piloting zone. Um, we established this based off of the recommendations from the transportation master plan, feedback from key stakeholders, and providing access to key destinations. This pilot area is, if you look at other communities um, here in Colorado, it's actually significantly smaller than some of those other communities. Um, but we felt like this was kind of a Goldilocks size for the city of Greeley. Um, it's small enough so that we can be nimble in our program management, um, but it is large enough so it's, you know, people can actually go go places. And we can actually get a good idea of how to um, manage the program, and it's actually a practical program for the community. So people can go from UNC to the downtown area. People, uh, we got feedback from UNC that uh, students really want, wanted to go places like the Centennial Library and the um, uh, King Supers off of uh, 20th Street and 35th Avenue. 
Um, but due to the relatively small market size for the actual businesses, we are recommending only one operator during the piloting period. Um, there is some concern that if um, we had multiple providers that they would be less invested in the success of the program because they would be making less money off of because they're competing against each other. Um, so we wanted our operator to be really invested in the success of the program and operating based off of the city's uh, standards. Um, so we just really wanted to see that the program pilot to be um, successful. So um, there are a lot of nitty gritty details when it comes to this business license. So we did provide um, those details in your packet. Um, I'm absolutely happy to answer any questions you might have, um, but if you want those details, like I said, they're in your packet, everything from fleet re redistribution, uh, removal, parking standards, geofencing, safety plans, uh, consumer standards on batteries, maintenance and customer service. Um, that being said, this is um, one piece of our integrated mobility vision here in mobility services. Um, we see this as um, uh, one piece of um, the mobility umbrella and um, it really complements well with transit. So um, I'll hand it off to Michelle to discuss really Evans Transit. Well, thank you for your time this evening. I'll give you an overview of the current state of GET and where we're going. Overall, the rider, GET ridership is recovered well from the service destruction caused by COVID-19. The national statistics on overall ridership recovery is at 77%, while Greeley Evans Transit ridership is trending higher at 81% of where we were pre-COVID. While this is all great news, ridership trending up, we've also seen an uptick in rider behavior issues, both from the social aspect as well as the safety risk. Due to the safety issues we've experienced, for the first time, GET has had to add security personnel, both on our buses and at our transit centers. The security, which was implemented in February of this year, has had a positive impact on the safety of our bus operators, as well as our customers. Our bus operators have expressed to us the gratitude by having security on our vehicles so they can focus on driving safely and not have to manage behavior. The customers have expressed feeling safer while riding our buses. So that was a positive addition to get transportation. Another issue that we've struggled with over the last several years and continue to struggle with is driver shortage. Bus operator shortage is not only a local issue, but also a regional and national issue. Bus operator shortages affect the quality of our service. We've been very proactive in driver recruitment and we do offer drivers needing to obtain their commercial driver's license, the opportunity to train, pay training, to be a, an operator for us. Um, in addition to the positive changes that came out of the comp and class study, we still see struggles with hiring and retaining drivers. So we've had to look outside our box and look at other operational opportunities. One of those opportunities that we're pursuing is contracting out our ADA paratransit service. Contracting out ADA and paratransit service for a community our size and larger is common practice in the transit industry. By contracting this service, staff will be able to maximize resources in other areas, ensuring quality of service to our customers. In addition to contracting this service out, we will be able to open, to more, open the door to more on-demand transit service. As was identified in Greeley on the go, East Greeley has been identified as a priority area for microtransit pilot. We're looking at ways to facilitate a contract to do a microtransit pilot on the east side. And go to the next slide, we can talk about transit funding. This slide represents the overall transit mobility funding. The total transit budget for 2024 is $8.4 million. Our Federal Transit Administration grant requires a 50-50 match for transit operations and an 80-20 match for transit capital. If you can look at the chart, FTA provides 47% of our total revenue and the City of Greeley provides 37% of our revenue. To give you a better understanding of how transit revenue breaks out, it's presented on the next slide. In 2023, the actual fare box revenue was 540,000. Nearly 300,000 of that was cash, fare, and bus passes. In addition, GET was again successful in participating in the Colorado Transit Association Ozone Season Grant Program. 
During the summer of 2023, we've provided free fare across all GATT services and received $166,000 to replace lost fare revenue. Other fare revenue is made up with the Ride Free with ID program provided by um, School District 6. They provide about $69,000 and Ames Community Colleges provides about $7,000. The local match is made up of our funding, our funding partners. The city of Greeley provides 3.1 million in local funding. The remaining 761,000 is provided by our partners, the city of Evans, Garden City, Fort Collins, CSU, the town of Windsor, UNC, and CDOT. Next slide. The Greeley on the Go Transportation Master Plan that was approved, was approved by council in March of 2023 identified the transition from traditional fixed route and ADA paratransit services to a comprehensive mobility program. We are currently working with our consulting team to provide the roadmap as was suggested on the implementation of this plan and meet the Greeley on the whole goal to provide an ample, easy, and connected transportation system, providing seamless mobility to enrich lives and promote economic vitality. As we navigate the best case scenarios for mobility in Greeley, <laughs> these are the areas that, that need consideration and funding. And I'll turn it back to Will if he can talk about some of those needs. Thank you, Michelle. Next slide, Bill. Um, on this last slide of the presentation, um, and as Michelle noted, notated from the mobility development plan, we expect several recommendations to come out of that planning exercise. As such, staff wanted to spend some time with you and make you aware of um, these recommendations that we expect out of that plan and answer any questions you may have. The first item on the okay. list is a transit dispatch and mobility app program. Um, this software replacement will replace an antiquated software that we currently have that's not only used by the team to utilize for operational purposes, dispatching and such, but also, um, more importantly, the public-facing components of mobility. With the goal of seamless mobility, this mobility app would allow re residents to prioritize, select, and pay for their mobility based off of what's most important to them be it what costs the most, be it their greenhouse gases, be it um, calories burned, whatever the case may be, it would allow them to do that. The next section on third is service modifications and expansion, which outlines several components. The first being regional service along Highway 34 to Loveland, for which we received a grant through the North Front Range MPO. So over the next year, we'll be working with our regional partners to finalize local funding share needed to facilitate not only long-term operations, but also bus cap, bus purchases. The second being microtransit, which is notably different than micromobility, uh, will provide mobility operations in areas of Greeley that may not warrant fixed route service, but there's still a need. Um, and lastly, the security program expansion, which would add additional security to the success uh, that the program that Michelle already notated. Um, the last component of this slide is service equity. This item, which is a topic across the country, um, is looking at how we facilitate that equity piece, right? Oftentimes, we bear a dollar fifty is a barrier for folks. Um, Hannah did a fantastic job during some of those pilots that Michelle talked about and actually um, did surveys on buses and found that people um, with that fare free, they're able to prioritize or not have to prioritize, they can do things that you and I often find you know, we don't have to prioritize because we just get in a car and drive. So be it a doctor's appointment, be it whatever the case may be. Um, and so this the pilot in there would um, fund that and all folks would be able to utilize fixed route and paratransit at no cost to them. And so with that, on the next slide, just open it up to discussion with questions uh, from, from council. Questions, comments for that guest. I would like to uh, delve a little bit into my favorite topic, rider behavior. Try not to put my other hat on, but at <laughs> some point it's probably going to happen. Um, is it a fair assessment that most of that is school-age students? It's regardless of age. Um, okay. And that's, you know, and Michelle can chime in here too, but it's the same from when I was transit manager, right? We have had behavior issues with young and old. Uh, and so it's, it's not just students. I'm sorry we have any behavior issues, but I'm pleased to know that it's 
across the gamut get it because I of course hear other things and I wanted to hear from those with boots on the ground. Um, so you think the the security is obviously for the safety of our drivers, which I'm guessing we all support, but that isn't necessarily um, occurring just because of the school age children. Right. So, and and it, and I think you said it, but I just want to reinforce it. Our our drivers feel safe. They do now. Okay. They you know that was a, a big issue that we had to discuss over the last few months. Yeah. And they do feel safe. They're very appreciative of that. Um, That's important. It's very important. Okay. It's also a big thing. Michelle's really alluded to with driver protection. Sure. It's a you know for them to feel that it looks like the driver must have like, like yeah. in an interaction with people. Um, which some of the challenging parts are yeah. the things that they don't like. Yeah. And the security, even in the limited hours that that we put it in place, is significant. Okay. And okay. It's made the drivers feel more comfortable. They feel better. Great. Um, so that's why we. That's why you see the expansion because we think it's expanding okay. across all the hours. Just, it's just when people get on the bus, they feel more. And I'll add to it's not just specific to Greeley, right? Yeah. Fort Collins has security on buses. RTD does. Carter Springs does. Okay. So, good point. What else, Councilor? I'll, I'll let them. It was I'll let them. I have um, several. Things here. Um, the first one is what is the what are you having a hard time filling? What position? Bus operators. What what was that? Bus operators. Okay. I just want to make sure that's clear because I feel like that's what I tell my constituents is a part of the issues of why we're not adding more routes is because we can't find bus drivers. So yeah. Uh, just want to make sure that's clear. On the mobility um, piece of it, is there an age restriction? So 18, they have to be yes. 18 years old? Yes, um, and we are also recommending that um, whoever the um, provider is has the functionality to turn on, um, verify by an ID. We don't have to turn that on, but having the ability to have that as a functionality, because um, in their terms of use, almost every single provider across the country requires that you're 18 years or older to rent a scooter or um, rent an e-bike, lift, line, spin, whoever. Um, but sometimes they can have a hard time with compliance. So that's one um, tool in the toolbox that some communities deploy is having that a scanning function. And there's some data um, sides of that, that they have to make sure that they don't have any data breaches or anything like that, but they have figured that out on the technology side too. So, and that's common um, yes. with across the country. The uh, ID scanning has only been deployed in a few communities, but it is a tool in the toolbox that we can deploy if we ask for it. Gotcha. I, I guess more so just the 18, because I think it's yes. maybe a 16 year old that is able to have a driver's license and, you know, gets up late. This is the best to go to school. And um, the option. the common the terms of use across the country is 18 years or older. Um, that is for liability purposes. What the providers themselves are likely going to require. When I sat down with D6, um, they they also really wanted us to have an 18 years or older requirement just for concerns for safety for their students. Um, so just so you all know, that's the feedback I got from that stakeholder group. Is there an upper limit, like? See, mayor's age? Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's right at your own risk. They do have a pretty long terms yeah, of yeah. use. Okay, <laughs> just check And are we looking at different options as far as like scooters, bicycles, or what? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, I, when I was doing some public engagement, I had some different device types. I will say that scooters were what people want the most, but people were interested in like sit down scooters um, and then electric bikes, and people were least interested in the pedal bikes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, are they able to, um, to, to like trailer a small little cart? If, they were going to try to go to the grocery store or something. So, um, because usually how how they're kind of bulkier devices because they try to prevent theft and they have like um, more locking functionality and stuff like that. Um, they don't typically have any kind of trailer, but a lot of the e bikes do have some kind of basket on the front. Um, and I would recommend we have an e bike functionality for that purpose of if you want to go to the grocery store, um, especially like. Um, people who don't have cars, you know, being able to have that functionality of 
you can't really, I wouldn't recommend riding on a scooter going like this with two grocery bags. That probably wouldn't be very safe as a rider. So um, having an e-bike option with a basket on the front would provide some of those cargo options, but they are expanding those um, device types all the time. We were um, in DC for a conference and there were a bajillion different device types. So um, as we maybe see the program grow, um, we might see um, different device types. So I think we'll probably start simple, but um, we, yeah. Thank you. Um, and then my last question is, is um, where are we at with possibly getting around to using health? So that'll be part of our mobility development plan. Um, and so outlining that as we look at routes and where they go. Uh, we currently do provide service to UC Health through an on-demand service. So through general public, anybody can utilize that. And then our paratransit. So we actually, in last year, we provided over 2,400 rides to UC Health campus um, on 65th. How did they request that service? For you? Sorry, they just call dispatch and schedule it. And so they can schedule that up to two weeks in advance or up to the day before, we do also offer some same day service if availability is, um, if there's available and on the, availability on the schedule. And this is probably not a question you can answer, but any idea if the hospital communicates that when they are um, releasing patients? Because I know right right next to UC Health is a salon um, that people rent out and they've locked their doors because of people that were on hold. Um, at the hospital that have gone to try to use the phone or yeah. try to find a ride if I don't know where that's so. we'll, we'll follow up with Marilyn Shockey on that. Um, when they opened up, we had some pretty in-depth conversations with them and making sure that that transportation piece was a, um, there was a knowledge base with that, uh, with their staff there. Mm -hmm. and we'll follow up on that. Pay sure. phones don't exist for them, for staff. They don't. They don't have a cell phone. Yeah. And you see how it's part of our stakeholders, and we're going to have our first yeah. meetings with the Great. stakeholders on the 16th. So hopefully they'll send some folks and we'll be able to gauge what their needs are and that they can really understand what transit's about here in Thank you. Councilor to Beauty, please. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Hannah, I uh, wonder if you've reached out to a couple of the bike shops in town that are currently renting e-bikes and scooters and what their reaction is to this program? Yeah, so I did want to note, so the current business license does not, um, it only affects operators where they leave the devices on um, public right-of-way for, for between users. So any of the bike shops where they're renting um, an e-bike and it, they end the the between users is they're stopping at the bike shop itself. They don't have to get the business license, so they can continue their business. Um, but uh, I I do I, it's if you're referring to Blue Sky Cycles, they do participate in Greeley Bikes, which is um, a, a group that um, I lead, and um, they are aware of the um, of the. Uh, piloting process and stuff and like that. And they're not concerned about the competition. I'm I'm sure that they are. Yeah. Um, and it might be worth. I don't know. Uh, you're going to go with one company, but gee, if we can support the local folks, I would hope we would do that. Uh, my next question is on the micro transit. I'm very um, interested in that, especially east of the highway wall. And um, so that hasn't started yet, but we're going to pilot it in 2025. We're a little more sooner, sooner. So we're actually, okay. that's one of the benefits that Michelle kind of touched on a little bit with the contracting of service for paratransit. Mm -hmm. And so working with them to okay. facilitate a pilot there for that, uh, for the east side is right. of 85 there as well. So mm -hmm. it's just real fast. It's mm -hmm. right. okay. And when you're talking micro, you're talking like a van, not Correct. a yeah. large city yeah. bus. So. Correct. Yeah, smaller vehicle. Unless there's higher. Yeah. Oh, Rick saw. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or even oh, yeah. uh, automated. So there's autonomous, I should say. So there's actually autonomous vehicles out there. That, oh, good. Yeah. So okay. And and do you see doing, you know, particular routes times a day or is it just on demand calling? Microtransit is on demand. That's the beauty of it. And people okay. can go when they need to go. It, it takes away the barriers that we currently have in place with our ADA service that you have to call a day in advance for a reservation. Microtransit, um, you know, and hopefully through our mobile app, 
they can just su suggest a ride on, on the mobile app, do it online. And then um, as we work through the contracting abilities, then we'll have um, you know parameters in place so that we have a, a wait period or they can go up. So it's gonna really open up transit, I think, for the community. Yeah. And even though the pilot is um, looking at on the east side, we're really looking, um, Hannah and I have been writing a lot of grants <laughs> at Microtransit. And um, so hopefully it'll be, um, you know, on a, on a community-wide basis. And that just really needs a mobility umbrella by giving people options. Thank you. Councilor Hall, please. Thank you. I, my question is on the micro mobility, the little scooters and stuff. And, you know, being two weekends ago, I was in Denver and noticing all these fun things, sit, you know, just standing there in the middle of the sidewalks. Is there some way to deal with that? I mean, to me, it's a little bit of scooter pollution. I mean, good grief. Yeah. In terms you got to like, walk around them to even walk. Yeah, in terms of like having good parking compliance and stuff like that. So um, what you see is when you have more dedicated parking places for scooters, you see a rise in scooter parking compliance. So um, we would like to see as the program grows more dedicated places for those scooters to exist, the closer you can have that to where the end destination is for that rider, the more likely they are to um, to do that. There are in-app functions that um, we will require from the get-go um, that uh, will incentivize good parking behavior. Um, users will have to take a quiz that show, you know, you're not allowed per code to um, block the sidewalk um, path, right? Um, you can't block ADA, accessibility, um, et cetera. Um, that's, that's already required. Um, if a device, let's say, there's a number on each device and a GPS. So if device one, two, three, four is found to be not complying with those parking regulations, that user can actually get a fine. I think um, one of the council members last time talked about how his daughter had an issue, issue with actually not trying to park incorrectly, but anyways, um, uh, so there's ways to kind of um, uh, try to encourage that good behavior for um, parking. Um, and uh, anyways, so um, having those scooter corrals and um, uh, having those kinds of ways to um, encourage good parking behavior um, is, is what we're recommending and requiring for, so. But are they, are they picked up if there's not a yes. use for them in a, so many hours or a day? Or yeah. Yes, and, and that's where the fleet redistribution comes in. So um, the the uh, operator will be required to redistribute um, devices based off of, um, you know, if they haven't been moved in a certain time period um, or if they're in, a, they'll also want to put their devices in a place where they're going to be used. It's like a good business model um, to put them in places where they're going to move around. Um, part of that, like I said, is trying to get an operator who's invested in the community, and that's why we're wanting to have one operator who um, may be a little more invested. Um, so um, yes, there is a requirement for redistribution. Usually um, from a lot of the other communities here in Colorado, they do that like really early in the morning, usually around like five, six in the morning. Um, yeah. Councilor Olson, please. Okay, my turn. <laughs> I only have give Tommy a shot. Tommy, I only have three. I, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe you answer answer some, that's all. Really, just more of a to build off Councilor Hall's point. Um, do we have if we start to see a lot of scooters just left out in places that are bad? Is somebody paying a fine for that at a certain point? Um, is that like? go back to the end user how does that work exactly yeah so um basically if the scooter is parked not complying with um the regulations of of it's not it's blocking the sidewalk it's um tipped over and it's found to be a user error they're supposed to take a photo at the end of their ride and if it's found to be their fault they can get a fee they can dispute that fee if it you know if they're like this actually wasn't my fault um but uh so they can get a fine directly as the user and then um we as a city um, in our through our business licensing practice, if the business themselves are not being responsible and not following the business licensing standards, we can revoke their license. Um, and that's also part of the piloting process is we're going to see how this goes for the first year. And then if we're like, this operator is horrible, we don't think they're doing a good job. We don't think this was a good fit for our community. That's kind of why we're saying, let's see how this goes for a year. Is this right for us? Um, 
Yeah. So. And are we can tweak things, right? And so that's that's the benefit of the pilot is being able to say, okay, we're going to add this language to the license, or make this adjustment, or technology changes, right? So that we can add those types of enhancements. So just to double check that one thing, if we see a lot of people parking poorly, is that just going to be money in the pocket of the business owner? Or is that going to be a fine that we actually take from it? So um, we do, we are recommending, and we have like this here in the, um, the packet, um, we are recommending that there is a performance bond of $20 per vehicle. So if they are not meeting the performance standards there is that performance bond per vehicle, um, but uh, basically they don't have to, um, sorry, uh, the, the fine is to the user, and we, we can adjust this and have language in the licensing process. Like if there's um, a certain percentage of complaints, let's say we could add that as language into their contract. We haven't finished that yet. Um, so that's really good feedback. Um, to put, put it not on just the user. Well, yeah, just, yeah, I'm wondering how that actually works because if the end user is just paying a fine every time somebody parks poorly, that's just, that that, that doesn't fix our problem. That just enriches the that, micro book book. That's yeah. something that we can build in the license agreement. They're actually incentivized yeah. at a certain point to have people park poorly. Yeah. So. Just like in our paratransit service contracts, we have liquidated damages. And so, when we have micro, it's that's how we manage contracts that we can add those in if, if that's going to be a benefit to the community. So to add on to that a little bit, when I was in DC, a lot of business owners, I'd watch them walk out and move that scooter after the user got up to the front of the bed, the business owner, put it where it wasn't supposed to be. And now you're going to find the user that parked it in the right spot. And then all of a sudden you're getting fine because someone moved it. You can pick those up and I think that's where the picture is, right? Work, you know what I mean? It's, it's just hard to take a picture every time you get off the scooter. I mean, you're in a hurry. Hey, just don't, hold on. Let me take a picture of my scooter. It's just difficult. So just think through that a little bit. Um, have we had any interest from companies to want to build with our, our pilot program? So yeah. we have. Yeah. Will, will we RFP that? or are we? So we're going to put an RFP out. We got interest. So... And it's in coordination with UNC. So UNC has been a big, they, they get hit up probably once a week. Yeah, with I, I think it. So yeah, so it, Anna's and, and Michelle have done a really good job of coordinating with UNC on that. Awesome. So they'll be a big part of that. Yeah, it'll be a big user. Correct. I'm almost yep. positive it'll be a yep. big user just in that little area. Um, My daughter used to do the laser scooter and she was called the scooter girl going through school. So she'd <laughs> love to grab on the one of the electric ones. Um, tech app. So the North Front Range has developed an app that that app that they are we going to be tying into that at all with our micro mobility on demand and some of those other things with our get and our our Uber Express because I think it needs to be sort of a global perspective with them. Yeah, it won't just be in with Think Really, right? It may have a di it may be a different app. It may be some of those types of things with that connection, right? So that'll they so buy they know in. how to communicate. It's, it's hey, you got to yep. get on there. You can exactly. click on this website yep. to get a Greeley on demand. There's right? there's just some functionality that um, I think the apps we're looking at have, like you tie an Uber, you tie in, you know, so you pull up an app and it's got all, it's got the scooters. It's got, hey, there's an Uber that's three blocks away. There's a line, you know, or whatever it is, right? And so it's all in one. And then you can actually, like I mentioned, prioritize it, right? So for me, I probably need to lose some weight. So if I can mark down, like I want to um, less calorie or burn more calories and it'll prioritize your trip based on that. Or if greenhouse gas is in certain walk. Yes, I should. <laughs> Just yeah. checking. Yeah. Because I should too. I don't want to prioritize that. <laughs> so something that's really helpful with the um, dispatch software is that would help us um, make sure that our it's called GTFS is updated. If we have a micro um, mobility zone or a micro transit zone, it makes sure that those things are updated, which actually directly ties into that application at the end of our MPO. That's how they actually, um, that's what, what they do. That's, that's, okay. that's right. awesome. Um, so Paul and I have talked about this before, and I think I've mentioned it, public private partnerships for on demand. So instead of us having vehicles and having drivers that we partner with, Uber or Lyft or somebody and pay them the fee that we would pay to pick up right. our residents at a fee and a fare that goes. I mean, I think, because then it's really on demand, right? And then they we have these this Uber public private partnership driving around because it's hard to get an Uber in this town. 
you know, I, I've had to walk because the Uber was like, oh, 30 minutes out. I, I can walk in 10. <laughs> so I, and it's not really good in the in the from walking home from Friday Fest. Uh, so well, just letting you know. For you. <laughs> it's a hike for me. <laughs> that would be dangerous even then, because <laughs> the rule will say that. But so I think the contractor is a private company for on demand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think something like partnering with Uber or Lyft. I mean, can you get because getting more Uber or Lyft people and saying, hey, from this time to this time, we're going to use you. I just think we need to look at that because we. We need to increase our Uber lift potential in the city too. It's part of that means sort of what I think you and I talked about is incentivized. Yeah. Right? So the city comes in, that helps build that base of Uber lift, other types of things. You know, so because we like to say we want to be agnostic, we want them all. Um, like we've talked about you know, 60 plus, we want to put them in. Yeah. So that because they all offer they offer service that we can't do ourselves. Right, so the more that we get that group together, and people see the way and options for them to choose to actually connect and move across the city, the better off it is. I, I think us paying their ride, yes, and not buying a bus is going to save us a ton more money at the long run. For them to pay a small nominal fee to get two bucks to get where they want to go, and we cover we cover the rest in in our. Area. It shows you what the difference in the service is, right? They all serve a different level. Transit serves, you know, so transit doesn't work well for a mile. Well, First and final. Okay. <laughs> so um, um, they serve a different role. Micro transit, micro mobility, which they don't want to serve that transit. Needs. So, like, so that's what we're trying to do. Is the more we lay out these options, um, what you're going to do, people are going to have better travel. Okay. And to we're gonna they're gonna give we're giving them a better call. I'm thinking about these folks that live in East Northeast Greeley that don't have a grocery store, and they could call an Uber and they only pay a dollar to get there. Mm -hmm. They won't be taking the carts and they'll be finding ways to get to shopping and will be helping our disproportionately impacted community even more. So those are the things I'm really thinking. Right. They can get to the right store that gives them the right price for the their needs that they have. Yeah. So those are the things that are missing. Yeah. Or, yeah, or even get home. It was actually we were yeah. at CRB. This is a great story, but it, it adds and highlights that, right? Even be able to buy ice cream. And like right now, if you live on the, you know, live far away from the grocery store, taking picture out, by the time you get home, you're not going to have ice cream, right? It'll be milk. Yeah. yeah. And so, where with micro transit or Uber partnership, right, you're able to, and, yep. and there was actually a story of that where somebody was able to actually for the first time in years have ice cream and brought it. So that's my tag on, because I know we're not the only community thinking about this. Not a lot of communities do it. I think we'd be like in the top 1% if we put something in place like this. But there has been pilot programs around this, and we have we reached out and started thinking about how that works. Yes. Awesome. We want to connect. Right. This should be seamless. So if we connect it internal to the city, now it's starting to connect it extra, right? Taking that. I, I schedule my whole route to grab a bus off of mobility out that takes me to the IA. Right, right, yeah. right, right. So you want to start in start in turn. Good. And then personally on one year free free pilot, I personally think the state of Colorado legislation, legislature should get in a room and make all transit for all residents of Colorado for free. It's about $160 million and they can they can fund this and then all of our citizens can ride for free. Personally, I think that's something that needs to be done. You're good with it at this level? Huh? You're good with it at this level then? Um, I'd have to see the numbers. That's it. Thank you, ma'am. Councilor DeBeauty? I, I then just curious about the liability, city attorney. <laughs> Are we, so if we partner with um, these organizations, private drivers, Uber drivers, and we have city logos on the side or uh, on the app. I mean, what is our exposure? I'm um, sorry, Councilman McKenna's <laughs> looking something up. Okay, um, I'm just thinking about our exposure when we enter into contract with micro transit and So we would clarify all of that in the contract term, so. Okay. We would have indemnification provisions just like we do in the other. Okay. Um, 
contracts and we would shift that liability to those um, companies Bonds. that we um, contract with. With regard to like the scooters and things, we would also shift that liability and then we would shift control over what the riders do on the scooters um, to the to the company. Okay. If I the thing I was looking up is um, kind of back to council member Butler's question. Um, parking in error or riding in error, we can also ticket the user, but we would have to be able to see. So um, if an officer or a mm -hmm. bus driver or a code compliance officer saw a rider um, riding in the sidewalk dangerously or parking um, not in the correct way, we would ticket that user and then they would be responsible. All of our contracts that if we contract when we contract for our ADA service provider, they have to meet all the federal regulations as well. So all of those assurances will come down from from what we what we apply to FTA as well as our contractors have to meet all those rules and regulations. So we have to monitor it very carefully. Yeah, but if you're going to contract with Uber or Lyft, then they're not. Some not of that is. That, that I'm sorry to interrupt. Some of that is by choice, right? And so that's the way that they work through that is because if we have multiple people they can choose from, then that okay. as a as a user, I'm making that choice. Okay. I'm the one as the user making that choice, which which helps facilitate some of the FTA things that Michelle talked about, drug and alcohol, all those types of things, as well as other magic some of the other pieces. And just just because we're paying for it wouldn't mean we're taking on that yeah, liability. Right. The, yeah. the yeah. user or the yeah. rider would have the same relationship with Uber or Lyft as you do um, if, if you get yeah, the one yeah. right now. So okay. basically what, what you're saying, it would be a user site subsidy kind of thing. Correct. So we would have, we, we would subsidize the user. The user would choose the provider. Correct. Yep. Councilor McDonald. Um, this on-demand transit, is it just limited to the city um, specifically or is there an option for our veterans to shuttle them to the VA? So that, that's all up for discussion. I think initially we're um, focused, as we mentioned, kind of on the east side, right? And then looking at the city, part of microtransit can be providing connections, right? And so depending mm -hmm. on the situation, you could pick someone up on the east side, drop them off at the mobility hub uh, at center place or a, a regional bus, right? And it's mm -hmm. all coordinated again to the app we kind of talked about, right? And paid, paid at once. Um, and then they can make it over to Loveland and then it's scheduled back. We know what time the bus, because again, as the GTFS or the real-time data, we know what time that bus is going to be there. So now the micro trans is coming back, picking them up and then taking them all the way home. So um, it may not be the same bus taking them there, but it, mm -hmm. it, through that technology, right, it's it's a seamless approach to get them from point A to point B. So after this pilot, we would be expanding our quarters of... That's something we'd be evaluating and looking at next year. Well, and, and then if you're talking to get to the VA hospital over at Loveland, is that what you're? I was thinking of Shining Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. The regional community is looking at service, but it's not coming to Green, it's going to Fort Collins, but we can get them to Fort Collins because we have our regional service. We're going to provide service to NUS 34, and we're already provided to uh, on the Green Express. <laughs> So I think you all recall that I would prefer to not see scooters in our community. <laughs> that being said, they're good for our community. You've done a nice job with this. You had to endure my Coors Field story. I have a much fresher one from Sunday. <laughs> I came out of Coors Field on the north side, and it was a lime green scooter convention. The people I was with thought I was a crazy man. I stopped and counted, and there was 38 of them there. Yeah. And I, I know that that's not commonplace. 38 people rode their green scooters to Coors Field and dumped them on the sidewalk and went to the game, and they probably came out and retrieved them. And I realized that if I went by their, well, I don't know if they're home, but if I went by there at a, at a non-Rockies game, probably wouldn't see 38 scooters <laughs> driven there. But what I saw Sunday was far worse than what I saw before. I'm done with that. Uh, <laughs> can I go back to a question? Can I go back to transit for a minute? Um, you you might guess that my couple of questions come from a 
transportation agitator who bends, bends my ear pretty frequently. Um, what's our approximate ridership between 3 and 5 p.m. Monday through Friday? Um, that's a good question. I don't know that I have that. And I don't need it. Just yeah, yeah. can you ballpark it? More than 10, less than a thousand. Here we go. Uh, yeah, I didn't mean that. I get that question. I didn't mean to ask you enough. No, you're not. I'll get to my point. Um, so go ahead. Yes, that, that is a very high user time. And it is because it's the school rush time. Yes. And part of the reason, and, and we'll just be frank here, part of the reason is because we have a driver shortage. Yeah. If we were able to, we would put more service out there and that would help alleviate it. Um, and I think that's why the, the ability to contract out our care transit service, our ABA service, is really going to help us provide quality service on a fixed route. So yes, it is high ridership during that time frame. And we, we really do need to add more service in that area. So that it just real fast. Michelle, working on this, if there's ways for us as we get, we can ship some drivers to this, we can double stack, right? So we can have multiple well, pickup, like we've been applied, and then pick up, and so there's not people waiting. So, think that so said transportation agitator assessment is that it's commonplace for seniors and or handicapped riders to not be able to get on yet because they're full of students. So and, we, and and I want to if if so I want to use my other hat to try to fix that if if it can be debunked that's great too but that can, that got my attention no definitely and it's something that we pay close attention to staff actually track the number of folks um at, at by bus stop right on a on a regular basis um and that's that's a performance measure that we track and I can and Michelle can correct me if I'm wrong but that's not an accurate statement okay. you know we have cameras on our buses too so. When we get to those points, then, you know, if we, we look at the riders on the bus, we can see who's on the bus at right. any given time. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's just another tool in our tool belt sure. to be more efficient. Great. That's been, been very helpful for the next time said agitator bends my ear. Because uh, I'm not in the trenches, so I don't know the answer. Are you putting up snow bus. roofs and making sure the snow is removed in front of those? And I think there's always there's always room for improvement, right? But I think and going forward, we're gonna look yes. at the contract yep. that we have with Lamar. So yep. that'll be coming up next year. 2025. Yep. So we're gonna look at that, how they're functioning and make the changes to it. So. Are there additional questions or comments relative to our mobility transit services? Great presentation. Good job, guys. And thank you to the uh, GET employees who That's are right. in the audience. Good job, guys. Wendy, moral support. Then you know the department gets free rides, too. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something Chief Turk, we are ready for you. Really, public safety picture 2023. Good evening. Good evening. Apparently, I do not have any. <laughs> Thank you for having me. You want me. the fire chief to just be with you? Or... <laughs> <laughs> we were actually just talking about that. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm here tonight to share an overview of Greeley's public safety picture. I'll be sharing an overview of 2023 and forecasting public safety priorities for 2024. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to provide a reminder about a community meeting scheduled for tomorrow night. The Greeley Police Department has engaged with the consulting firm AP Triton since fall of 2023 to undergo an organizational assessment. As part of the project, AP Triton has prepared a community survey, which will be posted on the Greeley Police Department website and other social media outlets. The survey will ask residents about their feelings on a variety of topics, including their perceptions of community safety, trust in the Greeley Police Department, along with their opinion of the department's communication and outreach efforts. Prior to the survey being posted, AP Triton will host a virtual community meeting tomorrow, April 10th, 2024, at 5 o'clock p.m. to discuss the organizational assessment and community survey. Myself and department command staff will be participating in the meeting uh, to address residents' questions and concerns. 
And uh, we, we are well into this assessment, um, as I stated, back, beginning back in the fall of 2023. Um, they've, uh, AP Triton has already received a plethora of data. Um, they've completed their site visit and done focus groups with internal and external stakeholders to include certain council members, community leaders, community members, um, and other staff. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move on with that, but yeah, I look forward to it tomorrow night. Thank you, Chief. Next slide, please. The agenda for this presentation is police key functions and responsibilities, an overview of 2023, future priorities and initiatives, and the purpose of this presentation is information. Next slide. The key functions of the police department and our responsibilities include the following on the slide. This is consistent with our goals and our mission statement, which is proudly working with the citizens to protect our community. Next slide. I'm going to move into the 2023 overview. Uh, we're working on our annual report, which we do um, a couple months into the year for the previous year, and those are all posted on our website. Our website is www.relieve.com, and it's a tremendous resource for all of our citizens. Some of the examples of the resources uh, that we provide are strategic plan, annual reports, hiring, say that again, hiring, um, apply now for laterals and cadets. All of our policies, complaints, how to file a complaint, a records request, commend a cop, crime maps, anonymous crime tips, media releases, and, and much more. Uh, next slide, please. So our goals for 2023 uh, remain the same for 2024. Um, we continuously evaluate data, calls for service, trends, and case law as we set these goals for all of the um, employees in the organization. The number one complaint received in the chief's office, I've said this a few times to you, um, are quality of life complaints specifically related to traffic complaints and safety. Uh, public safety responsibility to address violent crime and the small percentage of people who commit a majority of the crime in Greeley. Continue to work with North Range Behavioral Health, Housing and Homeless, the Downtown Development Authority, federal, state, and local partners, and our nonprofits to constantly work on public safety, to provide excellent police service through customer service, response times, and staffing, and to focus on our staff, and that's both sworn and non sworn. Next slide. For traffic safety, uh, we're always evaluating the data uh, constantly from enforcement and accidents to deploy our resources in high accident locations. We receive, monitor, and respond to all of our citizens regarding traffic complaints. Bi-weekly, our traffic sergeant sends out complaint areas for enforcement to all of our employees. And enforcement is not just tickets, it's also contacts and links. Next slide. Uh, this is our uh, 2023 number of enforcement actions and traffic stops, citations, and EOIRS all increased from 2022 to 2023. Next slide. Uh, this is our to total number of traffic accidents in 2023. Fatalities increased this year um, from four to 10 from the previous year. And this changes year to year. Over the last few years, I've seen it anywhere from two to 12. Um, and these patterns are hard to address just to, through data. Um, enforcement through stops and citations increased in 2023 and injury accidents overall decreased. And over the, um, you know, over the years, it's hard to find these patterns to tie to the traffic fatalities. And our strategy in traffic enforcement along with crime is uh, EDEX or data-driven approaches to address uh, approaches to address crime and traffic safety. So in addition to those bi-weekly updates sent out by our traffic sergeant to all of our officers, we also deploy our traffic unit to these um, locations that uh, where we receive the most complaints and we have the most accidents. Next slide. This is a heat map of our 2023 traffic accident distribution. Uh, no surprise, you can see the majority. We're looking at the two corridors, 10th Street uh, to the north there and Highway 34 to the south, and then our major artery avenues um, are the ones that you're seeing. The, the light green are small numbers of accidents, moving into the yellow of more, and then into the red, which is the highest concentrated accidents. 
Um, and we're continuing to work with public works to evaluate our infrastructure uh, to improve speed studies. Next slide. Pursuing ground defenders, our strategy for success. Uh, again, this goes back to our uh, policing approach of DDEX. We've identified two specific areas in the city that had the largest increases in part one crimes in 2021 and 2022. Statistically, best practices say this is where you should put your police resources. We did outreach in all of those areas with the residents. We constantly evaluated the data and the strategy is high visibility and contacts, some enforcement, but not all enforcement. Um, after evaluating the data in these two areas, we had a decrease in part one crimes in both of the areas. And we also utilized precision, precision policing and focus on those repeat offenders uh, who are responsible for the majority of crime in the three region. Next slide. Total number of part one crimes in 2023, we had 11, an 11% decrease in total part one crimes compared to 2022. And part one crimes include aggravated assault, arson, auto theft, burglary, homicide, rape, robbery, and theft. And I, I want to just put a qualifier in there that we are nearly complete with our NIBRS data into the, into the FBI database for 2023, but we feel confident and comfortable enough to report the 11% decrease. We do not believe that's going to change. Next slide. So these are total part one crimes by type that you're looking at. Our largest decreases were in aggravated assault, arson, and auto theft. And going back to 21, 2021 and 2022, our two largest increases were in auto theft and aggravated assault. So that's a good sign. Um, and, and theft, um, obviously you see the high number of theft. This is a national trend. And we are working with the Commercial Crime Collaborative um, to focus on retail theft and to be more efficient with our businesses. And, and I'd also like to note that uh, a, a lot of the decrease in, that you'll see in the auto theft, um, our center and the property crimes is, is due to all the hard work of our officers and detectives. And you'll see in the next couple of slides about that. So number of part one crimes per capita comparison. These are part one crimes rated per 1,000 population. Uh, Greeley and the Colorado cities listed are all reflective of 2023 data. The other cities outside of Colorado are benchmark cities, and their data is from 2022 as their 2023 data is not yet available. Next slide. This is a heat map of our 2023 part one violent crime distribution. Um, this is, does look similar to the traffic accident heat map, uh, but they are separate. And these areas represent pretty much our high density locations. And we're and they also consist of the uh, two D DAX areas that I was talking about. We can concentrate on these resources in context. Next slide. This is our property crime distribution. Um, our high crime locations in this map, uh, you can see the reds are, are mainly due to thefts, which is our highest number uh, quantifiable overall. Um, and that's with retail theft in our shopping areas. And I, you can see that's pretty consistent with where our shopping areas are. Next slide. Uh, this is our 2023 part one crime clearance rates by type. Um, we're comparing it to 2022 benchmark data as the 2023 data is not yet available. And we're above the national average and benchmark cities in most offenses. And this data has been pretty consistent for as far as I can remember in my career at the Green Police Department. Next slide. Total number of arrests for 2023. Physical arrests increased by 787 from 2022 to 2023. As we continue to move away from COVID, we have fewer jail arrest standards. But I need to note that not all physical arrests result in a ride to jail. Uh, these are actual arrests where we take, we call it physical custody, but it could end in a site and release uh, where we don't, we, we, we believe there's a, a likely expectation that the suspect will go to court without having to go to jail. So although that, that total number um, are all physical arrests that we count, not all of that results in incarceration. And again, I, I believe um, I'm, so, I'm so proud of our um, men and women who work for the police department because they've been working so hard um, to address our part one crimes. 
and um, kudos to them for all the work that they did last year. Next slide. Working with our external partners, and this is extremely important. Uh, we're going to continue to work with the city manager's office and Julian and Stanley, she's an outreach team to divert those calls that do not require a police officer. And, and right now, um, speaking with the fire chief and Juliana's team, we have a lot of resources going to calls. It's going to take some time, and the goal is, is to really to reduce those calls that do not need a police officer to respond. Let's send the appropriate resource rather than all the resources. But safety will never be compromised. So if there is a safety concern um, and, and, and we don't have the right resources to go, the police officers will still respond to it. And then our co-responders in 2023 also increased the response to mental health calls as compared to 2022. Next slide. Providing excellent police service, strategies for success. Obviously, uh, th this goes year to year and uh, to actively engage a community to build trust and foster collaboration. You'll see some of the statistics later on on how we're doing that. Uh, maintain open and transparent communication with our staff and the community. And then obviously to be aware of our response times um, and the needs of our victims and our witnesses. Next slide. In 2018, um, when I was a deputy chief, the police department invested in the customer service engagement software tool. It's called Spider. We uh, found some money that we weren't utilizing the service anymore. And really, we we're, were sitting around, and we get a lot of sales and demonstration calls. And, and we found this tool that allows us to, active, to actively engage with, get responses from surveys from people that we interact with. Um, if we send out a blanket survey, we may be getting results from someone who will never meet a police officer or need police services and really. So we really want to find a way to survey the citizens that we come into contact with. Every person who calls dispatch and they have the ability to receive text messages receives a follow-up communication from the police department. Um, this, this notification may also be a delayed response if it's a lower priority call and we're busy and we don't have an officer to send right away, they'll receive, they'll receive a text message notifying them that there's a delayed response. When the call is completed, um, we then send a message with the case number and the officer's name so they have a reference um, in addition to possibly a business card. And then they also receive a survey with a set of questions. Every morning, the watch, the watch commanders in the police department um, receive a printout of the survey from the previous day with comments um, so that they can address potential follow-up red flags or, or patterns um, of behavior. Um, I'm real pleased with our satisfaction rate and there are some variables that go with it. Obviously not everyone is happy when they call the police department with the response that they get. And I'll just use civil calls, parenting calls, um, child in custody, there's some things that aren't criminal that we don't have an answer to. So we can send you to what we believe is the right resource, but we're not parents and uh, we can't enforce a lot of these civil orders. So I, I, I see, we see those patterns on these responses. Um, so that one of the variables that comes in. And then we also receive quarterly reports that we evaluate. Next slide. This is our call to the service trend. This is the total number of calls for service that we respond to. These are only reactive, not proactive, so they don't include traffic stops, citizen contacts, or anything proactive in terms of follow-up. Um, in 2020, we saw a large decrease, which we attributed to COVID. Um, and then over the past few years, we've seen an increase and decrease. You know, we've added a lot of efficiencies, such as online reporting, crime tips. Um, and then lastly, you can see our response to reactive call for service of 76,000. 283 calls. Next slide. Response times. Um, I, would, I would focus your attention on the dispatch response times on the right side of the screen. The department goal is to respond under six minutes for a priority one call and under 10 minutes for a priority two call. And these are based on industry standards. And I know that the real-time information center will assist us when we can get eyes on a problem quicker than actually having the police officer respond. They may still respond, but we'll get those eyes on quicker. On the left side, those open total response times is the time the dispatcher answers the phone 
to the time our officer um, checks on scene. The time to the right are the dispatch response, which is the time an officer is notified by dispatch to respond to the time they get on the scene. Um, and this is something that we need to watch and continuously evaluate and really grows uh, geographically and in density. Next slide. Um, this is a, a pretty good list, but a not but not an all inclusive list of all of our community engagement 2023. It, it's pretty impressive. Again, attributed to all the work from our um, employees in the police department. And then I would focus on the on the right side under our presentation to track all of our community presentations that we did 286 of them last year, which I think is pretty impressive. Next slide. Recruiting and retaining the very best. Right, it's it's difficult um, over the last few years, and now to be a police officer in this day and age, and it's incumbent on command staff um, and me to focus on recruitment and retention. We need to constantly evaluate our salaries and benefits. Um, in 2023, we did a retention strategy uh, by utilizing a coaching program for a select group of employees, where they were teamed up with law enforcement pro professionals outside of the police department. Um, to where they could meet with and talk about job satisfaction, promote work-life balance. Um, we're going to continue to recognize those staff and accommodations for the award ceremonies. Constantly evaluate our equipment to ensure that our officers have the best and are safe and have all the tools that they need. Focus on mental wellness and mental health. Uh, this has been a priority of mine and I've been staff over the last two years. Next slide. Uh, this is an organizational chart, current as of today, and this is also available on our website for easy reference to the community. It will be updated as we make changes, and it lists all of our collateral specialized assignments, so everyone know who is responsible to who within the organization. Next slide. This is our 2023 uh, personnel information. Uh, we're currently authorized 150 sworn officers, total employees 228. We're currently at 154 fill, but six of those are in the police academy, and nine of them are almost near the end of their field training officer program, so they're getting ready to be um, out on their own. So essentially, 15 of the 154 are not yet solo effective resources. Um, as I stated, retention is the responsibility of police chief and command state, uh, command staff. Um, so when I talked about equipment and tools, uh, you're, you're, you're well aware that we've had a vehicle issue with the supply chain and getting vehicles. And we have about 25 to 30 here. Um, and they're sitting down um, at the shop waiting to be outfitted with lights, radios, decals. Um, unfortunately, there's some supply chain issues and some employee issues outside the police department that are causing the delay of some of that. That's why you haven't seen our new vehicles roll out yet. Uh, Deputy, Deputy Chief Zeller and I are actively involved in the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police Legislative Committee so that we can be the voice representing really in Northern Colorado uh, new legislation that comes out. Um, next slide. So our demographic slide. Um, the reason you see 159 to the right is because at one point this year, we actually overhired on paper, not solo effective one person. Um, but you're looking at the male, female, and non-white percentages of our sworn officers. Next slide. Uh, moving towards 2024 and beyond, um, you know, our priority shift according to the needs of the community, uh, based on council priorities and the strategic plan, uh, we're, we're working real hard on the real time information center uh, based on the second reading of the appropriation recently. And we're pretty excited to move forward with that. We're evaluating our body worn camera program. That's also our taser program through Axon. Uh, we're in the process of upgrading our cameras from the body cam three to the body cam four, uh, which is increased storage. Uh, better resolution, uh, better battery life. And so we're evaluating our contracts. There's also a new taser that's out uh, that we're interested in. It's called the Taser 10. And it basically increase, increases the distance that you can deploy it from 25 feet to 40 feet, which is safer for everyone involved, uh, our officers and for suspects. And 
then for the quality of life side of things, we're excited to move forward with the uh, rotor radar implementation in 2024. That'll be coming up for second reading on April 16th. Uh, our recently passed chronic public nuisance order, giving the police department tools along with road enforcement to timely address neighborhood issues and ongoing community leader meetings with the Latino Coalition and numerous churches and based leaders so we can continue our outreach and engagement. That is the end of my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions this time. Questions, comments for Chief Turk. Councilor Ross, there are several. Go um, right ahead. One of, the, one of the things that I noticed, through the, there's a few things I noticed, but one thing I noticed, first, before I start, I want to say I'm very proud of our police force in Greeley. You guys do an outstanding job. So my comments and my questions tonight aren't about your job. It's just trying to figure out some of the statistics. Okay. Uh, 2023 number of enforce, enforcement actions um, and traffic accidents. We're up in all both of those, right? So one, I'm assuming the enforcement actions are up because you've you're hitting some higher areas and you're doing more patrols in those areas, or it's just bad drivers, period. <laughs> well, are you talking about accidents? Or no, bro, I'm going to go to accidents. It's 20, 2023 number of enforcement actions were up in traffic stops, citations, and DUIs. We're up in all those categories yep. for you guys, your actions. Is there a reason for that? I mean, what is the reasoning behind it? Just curious. Yeah, a couple of reasons. Our staffing yeah. was better in 2023 compared to 2022. Um, as we set the goals and our watch commanders and our sergeants hold the officers accountable, accountable for that, that ends up being that amount of productive time. Traffic safety is a priority. Everyone in uniform, the Greeley Police Department is responsible for traffic enforcement. So I think what you saw was a little better staffing, a little better um, supervision, and an emphasis placed on that goal because my phone rings all the time. I know, I've been getting the same emails as you know. <laughs> um, then on top of that, 2023 number of traffic accidents, our accidents have increased in substantially, I think. I mean, just in, just in our area. Hit and run, uh, hit and runs, DUIs, but traffic accidents, yeah. injury act, injury accidents are down. But there's a lot of increase in this. Yeah, do we have a? Is there a national statistic online? I don't. Um, I, I, I think a lot of it's based on infrastructure, traffic congestion. I think as we've seen the community grow, and the number of cars, uh, and probably bad drivers. Um, I, I, I don't have a root cause for the increase. Uh, but I can hear it on the radio every day. Mm -hmm. yeah, I can see we can see it. I mean, you just see it driving around too. Um, can I continue? I got yes. three more. Yeah, uh, traffic. Uh, your 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 incidents uh, for part one violation, crime distribution, heat map, and you know a lot of it's since a lot of that that red is right downtown. Since we've added the security downtown, have we seen that decrease at all in that area? Yeah, I, I think this map is a little deceptive because it looks like it's downtown. It's not. Okay. Um, and I will tell you unequivocally, I review all of the reports we get uh, monthly from our security contract services downtown. It has improved. And, and I don't want to speak to the city manager or other city staff, but the number of calls and emails I get has decreased. So I know it's helped. And we also provide overtime officers. Um, downtown on Friday and Saturday nights during the busy bar nights. So I just know the visible return helps also. So I've seen the statistics and the data, I, I believe is better. When we're talking about just downtown, when you look at that, the heat map, it's a dense area uh, of people where they live. Okay. And then my last question is, as I look at your, your hiring, um, 2016, 152 officers, 20,000 more people, bigger area, 159. Um, what is your overhire like? So if you're if you're if you're to 154, what can you overhire to? Can you go to 200? So we, we've done staffing studies. We have a number in mind, and I have the authority to overhire without sacrificing quality. We're not going to just go get quantity, but the amount of departments we've had. Um, 2015 to 2019, we averaged seven to nine departures. 
of sworn so, officers a year. In 2020, that number went to 18. In 2021, that number went to 28. And then last year, it was 18 again. And, and I, 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 I can give you my experience and, and my knowledge here. COVID, uh, social justice, unrest, led in, in the market, really the market, that those are nationwide trends that we've seen. Keeping up with that has been difficult for a department of 158 sworn authorized. It's difficult to train and replace that many. Um, so to answer your question, the, the, the other thing that you look at, when you look at total authorized, we've reallocated a lot of our sworn positions from areas within the organization to be more efficient, i.e. Um, the, the judge hired two bailiffs outside of the police department, and we brought that um, person back into operations. So though the number of sworn police officers is a little deceiving on there, because we brought them back into our operations to better utilize those sworn police officers where they should be. Another example would be uh, the regional crime. We didn't need three sworn officers out there doing digital media, DNA, um, and computer forensics because you're required to do a lot of training to keep your posts and bringing them out of the lab to do that training when they weren't as a daily job out arresting people, it didn't make much business sense. So as those positions turned over, we reclassified a lot of those to civilian and then brought the sworn employees back into our operations. Does that answer your question? To yeah. answer the other part of the question, I know you're asking, yeah. is there a limit to the overhire? No. There's not. Uh, if we're able to fund it, because we have, since you have the vacancies and these vacancies last over a period of time, vacancy savings, you have that in, in our repertoire to continue to overfill. I hope, and I tell the chief, I hope he comes to me one day and tell me, hey, Randy, I'm over budget uh, for staffing. Uh, because in a lot of instances, I would, the rest of the department, no. Uh, <laughs> but police, that's the type of issue I want to be able to have and be able to try to address. And we would address it because we have fund balances and things like that, that we can address that issue. But that has not become an issue uh, for us. And it's something that we monitor every time he has a class uh, coming through to see where we are in that uh, difference from salary savings. That's why we're able when we started getting those complaints about downtown, we were able to move off duty uh, personnel to go ahead and do that instead of paying extra with our security firm because of the additional money that we have in savings. So it's not an issue from a money standpoint from the overfill. Hopefully we do get to that point, uh, but I don't see that in the next couple of years of that being a problem for the organization. Because you're doing a staffing report I, you're looking at a staffing report yes. today in future needs. So we could be, I just, I, to me personally, just as a, not a officer of the law or somebody that manages this 152 in 2016 and 159 in 2023 doesn't really jive in my head with the increase of area and the increase of people that we've had over that time frame. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and that's what I talked about, reallocating some of those sworn We've hired non-sworn civilians to bring some of those sworn back in. So we'll, we deploy them a little bit differently. I look forward to the drive downtown to be able to tell Randy and have a huge budget problem because we're for hard. I do. That's the day I look forward to. And you, I think, I'm not speaking for everybody, but I think you have all our support to say, find the money. Let's yeah. do it. And, that, and that's what we would do. Okay. And Thank I think the organizational assessment is going to help us with that. What are we looking at as a police chief? What are we looking at in five years, 10 years, where we need to be? If we know we're behind today, and where do we need to be in five and 10 years? Thank you. <laughs> Councilor McDonald. Um, with the people that, that are leaving, what is the biggest reason? Are they leaving the police department completely? Are they laterally going? What are, what are some of the reasons that they're, what are, what's your big, biggest reason that they're or going to? Like they live completely. Is your well, I, I mean, we do act easy to do, right? And not everyone completes them. I will tell you that we will we have not been or nor can we offer a remote work environment. We can't, and I can't compete with that. We need people in cars 
responding to calls for service. Yeah. So I can tell you unequivocally that a lot of our officers are educated, intelligent, and they have other options to make the same money to do different kind of work and have a better work-life balance. No weekends, nights, and holidays, work-life balance. Um, officers are frustrated with legislation and things that have happened the last few years in Colorado and across the nation, and they're tired. And, and that's been my biggest disappointment is watching these really strong 10 year, uh, 10 to 20 year officers not go, could not finish a career of 20 years plus because they have other options. And, and it's disappointing. And we've seen it across the board. You've seen officers go to other agencies. You've seen officers go to the private sector. You've just seen it across the board. Uh, there's not one leading trend uh, to say that, hey, all officers are leaving uh, due to they want less work or a different type of work environment of the community. It does exist. We have experienced some of that, but there's not a trend line to show, oh, that's the leading cause of what's happening. I think officers are making uh, lifestyle changes, though, uh, from the standpoint of the type of work they want to do uh, as related to the type of communities that they want to serve in and do those work. Being an officer in Greeley, Colorado is totally different than being an officer in Windsor, Colorado. And those are some of the dilemmas that we have to look at as we look at retention and recruitment. How do we uh, position ourselves to be that employer of choice as it relates to our police officers? And those are things that we're constantly evaluating as a city and as a police chief and a leadership team, saying, what are those advantages that we have that we can really start retaining and recruiting good officers. Can I piggyback a little bit on that? Yeah, I have some too, go ahead. So I've talked to a few officers, I have friends mm -hmm. that don't work at the city, maybe, maybe not, but work all over the state. Mm -hmm. And several of them have told me personally, Johnny, I am tired of arresting the same person for the same crime and getting out with no bail bond. And then I go back out and arrest them a day later for the same damn crime and they're back on the street. There's no accountability to the law. And we're tired of it. And I, I don't know. I hear that from people that have left, not people that are on, that have worked for you. But well, you'll hear from current employees also. Mm -hmm. They're just as frustrated with legislation and laws and bonds. You know, we don't we don't have control over bonds and, and the judges or independent contractors mm -hmm. or state law or state law. We have we can give input. Um, offer okay. amendments. Here's here's another another component to that that. The chief probably won't say, but I will. We've lost a number of officers, good officers, to a neighboring agency where they can make the same amount of money they make here with a take-home car. And I'm not suggesting they're lazy. None of them are, but they don't have to work near as hard as they do in Greeley, Colorado. In a take-home car. So well, we don't do that yet. That's part of it. But I will tell you that um, caseload is heavy for our officers. And if I can go to an agency and I'm a young buck and make the same amount of money and not work quite as hard, I'm going to, and we lost a number mm -hmm. to that agency and it's frustrating, but it is what it is. That's what I was alluding to. I know. Yeah. That they, and there's a work life balance, 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 right? That an officer that's hired today is going to be different. Ten years looking for different things. I mean, I came here from a different agency because I wanted to be in a busier department, have more opportunities for advancement. Um, and, and, and that changes over time. Chief, I want to take you back to auto thefts for a minute. 32% uh, reduction from 22 to 23 is outstanding. But regardless what that number is, um, I know that you all track a percentage of those that are either puffers, warming up their cars, or they go into Safeway or the post office, because I'll just be gone a minute, or not quite as drastic, they leave their keys in the car with the car unlocked, the only thing absent is a neon sign that says, please steal me. What percent of our auto thefts fit into that category? I, I don't know the exact total, but I know it's a high number. And I feel like I'm at a community presentation right now, so I'm going to put another plug in. <laughs> we would help our number out a lot if we actually locked our cars to leave the keys in them. The reason you know I rule, you can't pick stupid. Chief, once upon a time, that was about 75%. <laughs> I think it's a little higher. I mean, I know we had a if, if you Kia, we have a Kia and a Hyundai problem, um, I, I think that number is pretty much the same. I can get it. You know, there's been there's been national statistics about a couple of cars that are easy to steal. 
I get that. Yeah. But of, if of 875 car thefts, if let's just say conservatively 70% of them were either warming them up or left their keys in them, that obliterates that number. And it's just, I know it's a number that all law enforcement agencies face. And when you look at that decrease, we're a part of a regional group uh, that works with partner agencies and grants, and we move operations around. And we've done several of really over the last year where they target those known offenders. Um, and and I, I give a ton of credit to, to our property detectives and those officers who have worked those operations because it's working. What else, friends? Councilor DeBeauty. Thanks, Amir. Um, I just want to ask about homicide, aggravated assault, and rape, which to me are the biggest personal serious crimes. Um, how many are conducted stranger to stranger? Or are these people who are in some sort of relationship with each other? So it's a really good question. And I'm going to give you some, uh, some wisdom from someone that's been around. Person's crimes, so a crime committed against another person, when, when they happen, about 85 to 90% of them come to us with a named suspect. Property crimes, you can flip that number, very low percentage with a named suspect. So I know that, that the number of strangers to your question is very low. I can give you some numbers for um, homicide and sexual assault, but I don't have them for aggravated assault. So in, in 2023, of our five homicides, one was where the accuser was a stranger. In 2022 for homicides, um, of the 11, three of the accusers were stranger. For a sexual assault in 2023, of the 51 cases, nine of the accused were strangers. And in 2022, of the 46, five of the accused were strangers. So. Low, low percentages. I, I don't have the number for aggravated assault, but I, I, I bet it's a broken system with those percentages. And that kind of feeds into the public perception of, of safety, I think. And if we can you know, talk about what this violence actually is, is relationship, drugs, whatever. You know, if we can be more proactive in, in talking about this, is, I think that'll help our public feel much safer. You know, as long as you're not a gang member or a prostitute or dealing drugs. Or nothing good happens after two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, what did you say? I didn't hear what you said. Yeah. Nothing good happens after two o'clock in the morning. It used to be midnight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's what I mean. <laughs> It'll I'll go out until midnight. midnight. It's after 9 p.m. What are you doing? <laughs> at, at it's, a, it's a very good point. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe not. <laughs> that's outreach and engagement and telling the story in our yeah. message. Thank you. Um, I want to talk about the traffic accident distribution heat map. Um, and yeah, we see it on 34. And I just want to add 23rd Avenue looks like a at Highway 34, a very high percentage of accidents happening there. And that's not included in our talks about the intersections on 34. We're looking at 47th Avenue and 35th Avenue. And 23rd Avenue is a mess as well. So I, I wish we could, you know, work with our public works folks and when we're going for money to improve the highway. Yeah, those yes. accidents are actual 23rd Avenue on the underpass. Uh -huh. oh. Not on the underpass. Okay. And I can gladly get in with the uh, uh, with public works and, and go through the actual data as to where they're at, but I, you're not looking at the overpass there for accidents, you're looking at the under. Okay. That's, That's a lot. And then you kind of those signals, and they've tried to work on that for, I've been here for 32 years, and it's just gotten better, but it's never gotten good. Bottlenecks. Yeah. Council McDonald. Um, Chief, thanks for just running an excellent police department. I appreciate you and appreciate your leadership. And I'm going to give um, the police department another plug at um, attending Citizens Police Academy. It is just, it's really opened up my eyes and put a person behind a badge instead of when you're going down the one way and you're like, oh, it's the cops and slam on your brakes. Like there's an actual person in there that has a family 
And I love that we do the um, those awards. So I attended the, the last awards and something just really hit me. And I think we don't think of it because um, most of us have a nine to five job. But one of the officers um, said to me, my kids know when Christmas is because I tell them when it is because they can't celebrate on the actual day because they're working. Mm -hmm. So it just puts things in perspective on the sacrifices that they make to make our community safer. So I think all the council should go to it, but that's just how I feel about it. Thank you. Any final thoughts? So also that was for you. Kudos was for you there. You're the one that's the yeah. answer. Actually, she's doing it for us. Actually, she's doing it for Thank you, Chief. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you much. Me. Great team, too. Thanks for everything Thanks. you do. I have seven. Uh, Mr. Lee, any additional meetings or other events to discuss at this time? No, you are. Thank you. Um, item eight is an executive session for the purpose of discussing personnel reporting to city council. Could I get a motion, please? Here I move to go into executive session to discuss the following matters provided under CRS section 24.642 for the ref. Greeley Municipal Code section 2.1516 to discuss personal report personnel reporting to the city. Second. Councilor Payton on the motion, Councilor Butler on the second. Roll call vote, please. Aye. 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 Aye.